the testimony that God has entrusted to me to bring to you. And I pray he would breathe life upon it again. And that his presence would be seen and known and heard. And with that, let us pray. Father, come now, speak. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen and known and heard. Not I, but Christ. Be lifted up. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, for entrusting each of us with testimonies, Father, that speak of the realities of heaven, of a mighty God, and a God who loves and cares for his own. Bless us now as I share, and I pray that hearts would be touched and changed, Lord. Let us see and vision that which we would want to be and then become the change we want to see. We thank you and praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so I will share with you my testimony beyond the veil of darkness. I was born in the beautiful island of Jamaica and I was reared in England. Here are a few pictures of my hometown, Gloucester, in England, near Bristol and Bath and near Birmingham, if any of you have been to England. And this is a typical home that I was reared in. We had beautiful country around us. We had the cows and the sheep. I enjoyed sports at school. I enjoyed netball and hockey. I was very athletic. I loved running. I still run today. I run five miles and I sprint and I, I love to keep up my body and uh, keep healthy. And I love the 200 meter dash and the 100 meter dash. Those were my favorites. I always race my kids as well when I'm home. <laughs> this is my church in Gloucester, England, in which I was baptized. And I was baptized at the age of 12. At 17, I left home and started my nursing career at the Rowley Bristow Orthopedic Hospital in Surrey, just outside of London. And here are some pictures of me as a young 17-year-old nurse. Yay! Isn't she cute? <laughs> and that's when the party life started for me. I was out of the house, you know, out of that Seventh-day Adventist home. No more... I, had, I didn't have my parents over me anymore, so I started to party and drink and smoke and, and uh, have boyfriends, and I was the best dancer on the dance floor. Oh, my goodness, Lord. You know, when, when, when Seventh-day Adventist kids go out, they go all the way out, you know? <laughs> but, but we feel so awkward as well while we're out there, you know? <laughs> I remember saying to myself, I'm never going to get my ears pierced, but I'll wear clip-on earrings, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the funny things we do, I tell you. Uh, anyway, that's me, 17, partying. It was around that time of my life where I was free and footloose and fancy that I met uh, a handsome guy, Mohammed. I went home for my weekend visit to my hometown. And while I was there, my brother said, come on and listen to the reggae band that we just started up. So me loving reggae music, you know, I went off to hear this band and in walks this tall, handsome Indian guy. And he was amazing. He even spoke a little patois, you know, the Jamaican patois. And that really just turned me on. And I said, whoa, he is the cutest thing. Our eyes locked and there was love at first sight. Wow, things moved rapidly, rapidly. And at the age of 18, I was pregnant. I did not finish my nurse training. I had six months to go, and so I made a decision to go home and have my baby, and I had a little boy. His name is Javid. He was born. I was uh, 19 years old when I gave birth. I moved in with my boyfriend, started to live with Mohammed in a little apartment there in Gloucester. And five months after giving birth to my first son, I was pregnant again, and this time with twins. And so now I give birth to twin babies nine months later, and I have like triplets, three little kids, and I'm only 21 years old. At that point, my parents make a decision to leave England and go to live in the United States. And um, so Muhammad, at this time, his parents, being so perturbed about their young Muslim son, their only son, and very concerned about, you know, him having a proper Muslim wife, decided to send him to in, in, uh, India 
to find a wife. So we split up, and he goes to India to find his wife, and I now decide to go to the United States of America to be with my parents, with my three sons. And so we, you know, split up, and I head to the United States, and I'm living there for about six to eight weeks or so. I hear the door knock. I open the door, and it's Mohammed. And we're in love again. <laughs> and so we whiz off together, and we say, let's get married. Who cares about what the parents think? You know, my parents were so distraught. They were dismayed. But we didn't care. We were in love, and our children were going to understand Christianity. They were going to understand Islam, and then they were going to grow up and make their own decision. And that's the compromise we make foolishly when we want to have our own way. Oh, the plight of a youth, I tell you. And so we had our Muslim wedding, and from there, life began. We later had another baby. Little Aisha was born, our first girl, and her three big older brothers. And then later we had another baby. I was pregnant here with Zaina, my youngest, and um, we later had another healthy baby girl. Well, still partying, still in the world, still doing my thing. Muhammad was now rearing the children in Islam, teaching the boys uh, their Quran and their prayers. So a year after the birth of Zaina, I suddenly felt lost and confused, depressed, sad. The whole scene changed. Something was happening in my heart. Something was happening in my mind. This evening, we'll talk about the conscious and the unconscious a little bit and how those memories of the past start to come in waves again. I started to remember my childhood. I found myself at a fork in the road, very undecisive about my future, a young mother, 26 years old, with five children, and feeling I have nowhere to go. This is my life. It's over. It's done. I must dedicate myself to my children. No more career goals for me. And so at this fork in the road, I'm working the night shift at a hospital. I'm a nurse assistant, and I come in, and I'm depressed, and I'm sad, and night after night, I'm feeling this way. And one of the ladies came, and she said, Esme, what's going on? I said, I don't know. I said, I just feel so depressed. I feel like giving up. In fact, I feel like leaving home and just leaving my kids, my husband, everything, and starting my own life. And she said, Esme, don't do that. So God sent this woman, her name was Olga, and she took out of her purse a book, and she gave it to me. Steps to Christ. I started to read that book, and memories started to come. I remember this book when I was a kid, and I finished that book so quickly. Within a day or two, I came back. I felt as though the thirst I had inside was beginning to quench. And I said, Olga, do you have another book? And she said, yes, yes, in fact, read this. And so I decided to read The Desire of Ages. And ladies, I fell in love with Jesus. He was the desire that I had and I didn't know. And all of a sudden, life was worth living. I started to pray. I started to seek out a, a church. I wanted to start attending church again. I started on Wednesday night prayer meetings. I would attend just by myself and listen. They were deliberating and studying the book of uh, Revelation at the time. And I heard things I never heard as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian growing up. It was amazing. But my children, my children, they were still learning the Quran. This is little Adam reading and studying and memorizing scriptures in, in the Quran. And I would hear my children crying and weeping because this was night after night after night. Muhammad would bludger them and say, read and study and read. And, and they had to learn. And then for me, I started to remember the children's story. Remember the two Carolines? Remember Uncle Arthur? All the, the life I had growing up, the joy of cradle roll and, and primary class. And hear the pennies dropping, hear them as they fall. Everyone for Jesus, he shall have them all. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. All these songs started to come back into my conscious mind. And I longed for a deeper relationship with Jesus. 
the beautiful felt boards, the stories that we grew up with was in my heart and mind. And I just wanted Jesus and I wanted my children to know him. And I said, Father, how now can I teach my children? Muhammad has taken up the, 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 the religious aspect of their upbringing. Lord, what must I do? And when I would ask Muhammad about taking them to church, he would say, oh no, they're Muslims. No, it's too late. I had a dream, and in this dream, I saw my father breaking bread. My father had passed away, and I said, Papa, give me some of that bread. And he said, no, this bread you have to get for yourself. He pointed the bread out through an arched window, and as I looked through that window, I saw the beautiful face of Jesus. And as I looked into his face, he wept, and he beckoned me to come quickly, quickly. And I knew time was short. And I knew I had to make this a do or die. It was all or nothing. There was no more turning back. I had been in the world. The world had offered me nothing. And now I was in a marriage that I had not been given the permission of God to be in. I was in a relationship I couldn't get out of. I believed in marriage. And I said, Lord, how do I change this? And he said, my grace is sufficient. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. You will be the witness to Muhammad now. I died for him. I love him. And I care for him. So now you be the witness. And so I said, Lord, teach me. Show me. And I would have private uh, worship and, and, uh, with my children. I would teach them songs and start teaching them about Jesus when Muhammad was at work. And when he came home, we would quickly change the scene and carry on as usual. I confessed of all of my sins, of the marriage, of rushing ahead of God. I repented. I wept on my face to God. I was experiencing true conversion. No longer was I a nominal Seventh-day Adventist, just growing up in the church, learning the rules and regulations. Now I was in relationship with Jesus. And it was making all the difference. Now I understood the theology of my faith. Because when you're converted, it makes sense. And I began to love my faith. I used to hate turning off the TV on a Friday night. And now I rush to turn it off to have my time with Jesus through those sacred hours of the Sabbath. But Satan's wrath was over my decision. You see, Satan wants you to think when you make a decision for the Lord that now you're going to go to hell. Now you're going to have a hellish experience because you made that decision. He makes you feel as though you made the wrong decision because things start to happen in your life that has never happened before. You see, because now you're walking against the tide, whereas before you were just moving with the tide. But when you turn to walk with Jesus, the obstacles, the fight, and you feel like you want to give up and you say, but Lord, I thought it was going to be a bed of roses. Then you realize it's not Christ, but it's the enemy of Christ who is angry with you. And I saw Muhammad change. He changed overnight. His whole personality was belligerent. He was angry. He became violent. He was now pushing me around, and, and he punched me in my face even. I'd never seen him this way, but I realized now that I turned to Christ, this was spiritual warfare. And I was told by the Lord at that time to put on the whole armor of God, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And I put it on, not knowing the depth of where this would take me. That week leading up to my baptism, all hell broke loose in my home. And I cried out to the Lord, Father, what must I do? Muhammad showed me a knife and he said, I will kill you if you baptize this week. And I went to the Lord. I didn't know scripture. I was a babe. And I started to flip through the word of God. And as I flipped through the word of God, oftentimes it would just land on a, on a scripture and I would read it and it would be so appealing. I knew it was God's voice. 
And I remember Luke 12, 50 said, you have a baptism to be baptized of. And how distressed as me you are until it be accomplished. With that, I took up faith and I said, Father, then I will go. And if I die, I will die in Jesus. And the next sound that I hear will be that of the trumpet sound and Jesus coming. So death had no power over me. I was ready to die. And so I prepared my mind. I told my Bible worker who was working with me, I will be baptized. And by God's grace, pray for my children to be there. Muhammad was angry, violent, threatening, threatening to take the children from me. That night before my baptism, I went to church and it was communion. And we had a beautiful time in the Lord. The whole church was praying for my situation and praying for my children to be there to witness this thing. The next morning when we woke up, Muhammad woke up, the angry, the, 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 the violent man woke up and left the house like a lamb. I saw the power of God subduing his spirit. And when he left the house, I got up, I got dressed, got the kids ready, and we took off, put the babies in the, in the double stroller, my three little ones around my side, and we just took off to church. He took the car, he tried to make life difficult for me. There was no more vehicle for me to get around with. No, everywhere I had to go, I had to walk. But I thank God it was a bright and sunny Sabbath morning. And I truly expected to die that morning. But God, in all his grace, saved me and showed me that we must trust him to the very edge. We must trust him to the end of time. We must not allow our fears to dominate us. Had I given up, I wouldn't have seen the glorious result of prayer. And seeing a man so angry, so violent, leave like a lamb. God was working. That day, I was baptized and my eight-year-old son, here's why my children had to be there, stood up at the altar call, gave his life to Jesus, and he too was baptized some weeks later. Well, all of heaven rejoiced because now that child, that lost sheep, Esme, came home. We rejoiced. And I felt as though heaven rejoiced. I could see the angels just wafting their wings with joy for that one lost soul coming back to Jesus after all those years. Well, Muhammad became very religious now. And he started praying five times a day. He met men who came from Saudi and from the Middle East who were there schooling. And these men were amazing because they had careers. They had more education to get. They had rich and wealthy families. And they told Muhammad, if you want your wife to be a Muslim, you need to get her to Saudi Arabia. Bring the children and take charge of your home. And so Muhammad started a plan. As he prayed with these men five times a day, they devised the plan. More and more, the plan became appealing to him. He told me we would live there for just two years and make some money, come back and buy our home. And I prayed, I fasted, and I started to receive answers from the Lord. I wanted God to show me. I didn't want to go, but I wanted to do the will of God. And as God started to show me through a song, through a verse, through a sermon, through those prayer warriors in the church, I realized more and more God was saying, go, I have a work for you to do there. See, God, he makes use of us everywhere we go, if we're willing. We can be a witness in any realm. No matter where we go, go in the will of God. Even if he sends you to the, to the pits, go with God. If he sends you, then go. Do not be afraid, for he will be by your side. And he has a greater work than you can ever imagine. For the work is his and not ours. And so finally... I made the decision to go, and I was a call porter at the time. I had started working as a call porter, a literature evangelist. I couldn't help but tell of the good things God was doing, and so I would knock on doors with my books and, and share the gospel, and so I tore off all the covers off my books. I packed them all. We stayed in England for about three months where my parents had now re reversed and went back to England, so we stayed there for a little bit, and of course, his parents were there, and we visited for a while. And so I wrapped 
and hid all my books as we were packing the night before. And that night, God said, dress as a Muslim woman. I heard it as clear as day. And I said, oh, really, Lord? Dress as a Muslim woman. I said, okay, just obey. We don't always have to question God. Just walk in obedience and he will unveil. That's what trusting in, in God is all about. Trusting his voice. And so that night I put on my beautiful, uh, got out my beautiful uh, Muslim attire and dressed. And we finally left for Saudi Arabia the next day. Packed all my books, prayed over all, all of them, and off we went. I told my children, now we are going to be undercover agents for the Lord. We are missionaries and we have a work to do for Jesus. Oh, I tell you, all those books packed, ready to share the gospel. I was just on fire for the Lord. We finally arrived in Saudi. It was midnight. It was hot. It was sticky. What a culture shock for me. I prayed, Lord, lead us to the right custom agent. I prayed along the way praying without ceasing. God, lead us to the right custom agent. I have a lot of books. And I was a little bit ignorant because I didn't realize the penalty for bringing in Christian literature, which you will soon find out. And so my bags started, all of our bags started to go on the conveyor belt. They searched us. They were very, very careful to search, the, to search us. <clears throat> I didn't realize, as I said, excuse me, that the consequences for bringing in literature was steep. And even though I hid my Bible and hid it well and wrapped it in an old sweater, they found it. And immediately I started to tremble. And I was wondering at the same time, how come they didn't find the other books that were in the other suitcases that were packed? And I was just attributing that to prayer. I was just thanking the Lord. You see, I just prayed for God to give me a wonderful power powerful experience. When I came back to God, I didn't want a mediocre relationship with God. I wanted to know God like the prophets of old know God. That's what I prayed for. I said, Lord, I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to talk with you. I want to walk with you. I want you to lead my life. I don't want a, just an everyday kind of relationship with Jesus. I wanted more. Huh, be careful what you pray for. They found the Bible and they started to question me, question, well, sorry, question Muhammad. You see, they don't speak to the women because we're women. And as I looked down, I saw that I was dressed like a Muslim woman. Now it all made sense. We look like the typical Muslim family. Muhammad dressed in his Muslim attire. I am dressed in mine, our children. It, we just look like the typical Muslim family. So they were very puzzled to find a Bible amongst a Muslim family. And of course, they wouldn't speak to me. And the Lord said, keep your head down and just look like a Muslim woman. <laughs> and that's what I did. And so the Bibles, of course, are forbidden for non-Muslims. And this is where you can find yourself in hot water. It is punishable by law. You can be imprisoned. You can be executed. You can be flogged in the streets as women. You can have your fingers cut off by a machine there. And I started to pray and I called upon the name of God like Moses. And I said, Father, you are going to have to part this Red Sea. It is too big, but you are a mighty God and you've done it before. When you give God his word, it doesn't return void. And I prayed and I quoted scripture, stand on the promises. His word does not return void. And I said, Father, your word is a lamp unto my feet. It is a light unto my path. Therefore, I need this light to see in this dark country. I reasoned with God. And I said, and this is your word. It won't return. So I know you got to do it. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know you have to do it. I cried out. And suddenly I heard his precious voice say, don't be afraid as me. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. The Lord will fight for you as me, and you shall hold your peace. God will answer the prayer of faith. And especially when you stand on his word. And tomorrow we're going to talk about prayer. I saw something come over those officials. 
They became confused. They scratched their head. They came with guns and weapons now. They were serious. And suddenly one of them said, you can go. We trust you and we won't search the rest of your luggage. Hallelujah. Because in the rest of my luggage, in my carry-on, was all my ammunition. I had steps to Christ, desire of ages. I had councils on diet of food. I had patriarchs and prophets. I had so much stash. You know, I was a coal porter. But the other books that I thought and wondered about had been removed prior to our baggage being um, taken in at London Heathrow by Muhammad. He had gone through everything and found all of my books, discarded them in the garbage at Lon in London, and thank God, in my carry-on was all I had. It was all I had. But it was enough. It was enough. They took my Bible, sisters, and they put it back into the suitcase. They closed it, latched it, and said, go, we trust you. Hallelujah. God parted the Red Sea. And we all, my children looked at me, I looked at them, I said, I told you we're undercover agents for the Lord. <laughs> we walked in. It was the dawn of a new day the next day, and we woke up that morning, the beautiful home, the servants, all of that Muhammad had promised us, the job was non-existent. He only wanted to get us there, and now we were there. We spent that night in a hotel in a little orthodox city, very stern city in Islam called Dammam. And in little Dammam is where we stayed, in a little rinky-dink hotel. And immediately I was homesick. I realized that I had made a mistake. I started to doubt God, just like the children of Israel, doubting God after the wonderful miracles of God. And our first day we spent at the marketplace where I received my first gift. The religious police were there. They were looking on at all the women, watching, making sure they were covered in their uh, burqa, in their covering. And so the very first thing Muhammad bought for me was my cover. And I put it on immediately because those matawas, they don't play. They hit you and they hit your ankles and they, they will hit you in the back if you're not covered. And I didn't want to be hit by anyone, so I put on my cover. And uh, you know, when in Rome, you, they say, do as the Romans do. And I put it on and I said, truly, 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 we are undercover agents for the Lord. <laughs> All the way. And so I put on my burqa and from that day I wore my burqa. And many a times I would cover my face completely. I normally put it on when I'm sharing my testimony. But recently I've decided to no longer do that but just to show the, the pictures. Um, and so here I am, dressed, going from place to place. I tell you... It was a blessing in disguise many a times because my, uh, my communications with my family broke down and I was not able to get letters out. And so I would um, hide the letters I would write in my burqa and take it to a clinic where I met some nurses who was willing to help me. They gave me their address so I could write my letters and give it to them. They would mail it and then my family would write to that address and I would go and pick up my mail from them as well. The burqa was handy because you didn't have to even wash your face when you got up in the morning. You just throw that thing on and rush to the store if you need to get something and it didn't matter, it was great. <laughs> so here are the nurses that I met, they were wonderful. And I was able to get letters out, parcels in from my family. And I tell you, as soon as the children sneezed, we were at the clinic. As soon as they coughed, we were at the clinic. We found every excuse to be at the clinic two and three times a week. Muhammad would say, clinic again? Who's sick this time? Oh, you know, and we would be at the clinic. Well, it was wonderful to speak English with the nurses. They were from India, many of them, south of India, and they worked hard. And I met Catherine, she was great. Catherine was interested in Bible studies. She knew I was a Christian. We all were Christians there, and we shared Christ. What a joy to finally meet some Christians in Saudi Arabia. And of course, it was quiet. And so we started to share, and the Sabbath was amazing. She wanted to know about the Sabbath. And I said, thank you, Jesus. If it is only for this reason that I am here, then let it be. Oh, God, thank you for Catherine. Well, one evening, as um, I went to the clinic, 
you know, I would work, uh, study with her on, on almost two to three times a week with my little girls would come with me and the boys would go off and do their thing. I noticed Catherine was very, a uh, little bit indifferent toward me. And I said, Catherine, what's wrong? And she said, don't talk to me. And I said, oh no, what's going on? And so I waited for her shift to be over. And I said, Catherine, what's going on? And she left and she was walking fast and I was walking behind her and she kept crossing the road and crossing the road and I was following her and she rushed into her house and slammed the door. And I stood outside of her door and I said, Catherine, open the door. What's going on? Tell me, I'm not leaving until you tell me. And I stayed for a little bit and then she opened it and looked and she said, Esme, you must go. She said, your husband was here yesterday. He brought the officials and they took my husband to prison. He told them that we were, we were spreading Christianity. She said, if we are seen together, they will execute us. Go, we cannot be friends anymore. And so I left. I was so bewildered. She was the only friend, spiritual friend that I had. I was so broken. I was angry. I had a whole lot of emotions going on. I didn't know what else to do now. The doctors at the clinic said, Esme, we can't do the letters for you anymore. Your husband is a dangerous man and he could shut down this clinic and we need the monies to send home to our families. We can no longer do this. And I had to respect that. But Jesus said, Esme, I won't leave you comfortless. There is a friend that sticketh closer than any brother and his name is Jesus. Now it was at the dinner parties where my greatest witness was now being challenged. You see, these big, beautiful homes are the homes that belong to many of the Arabs that um, Mohammed had now become acquainted with. He had now a wonderful job. We had a lovely home. And we would go to these homes, but the men at the home, as we entered the big gates and entered in the doors, the male and female would go, the male would go through one door, so Mohammed with the boys, myself with the girls in another door, and we would part for the whole time and we would sit in different areas of these mansions and eat me with the ladies and him with the men and the boys. And the children could go through the house, of course, to see mom and dad, but we didn't mix. So the men would sit and eat from a huge plate and talk and share. And all these men had told their wives, who I was sitting and eating with, to convert me. Convert, convert her. Make sure she's a Muslim. And so these wives started to work on me. And we would all sit down together. We would eat with our right hands. They would take a big old goat and plop it on top of the rice. And everybody was eating and indulging. But you know what? I had, I had come to the place with my diet. God moved things in my life swiftly when I came. Remember the beckoning was swift. And God, he grew me as it were overnight. And I saw the message of diet and health. I saw the message of, of, uh, of spirituality and diet. And God says, in order for you to hear my voice, to know who I am, to have a closer walk with me, he says, I want your diet pure, just as I did for Daniel, just as I did for uh, John the Baptist, just as I did for the children of Israel. God gave a specific diet to his church that the magnetic influences from heaven to earth would be strong. God has given our church a health message. And many of us have not abided by that health message, and I was one. And it's not easy. It's not easy. But I want you to know why this is so important in my testimony. Because without it, I don't think I would have been here today. I don't think the decisions I made, I could have made. I don't believe the strength I had, I could have had. When we've done all we can for Jesus, he will do the rest. But he won't do the work that we can do, that he has called us to do. He won't do it, but he's polite. He'll influence us, but he'll stand back and wait for you to make the decisions. And as I sat and ate with these women, they started to ask me about my diet. They noticed I wasn't eating the goat. They noticed I wasn't drinking this very thick black coffee called gahwa. And then they started to ask questions. Madam, why are you not eating this and eating this? And I said, hallelujah, here's my testimony. Here's my witness. And I started to share with them. I said, ladies, 
I believe my body is the temple of Allah. <laughs> and I said, Allah wants to speak to our hearts. Allah wants to know us more. And these ladies sat up. They started to listen. They said, tell me more. And I started to tell them the relationship with diet and the mind and the body and all of this, the little information that God had showed me, I started sharing with them. And I said, this has been amazing. I said, I, I fast once a week so, so that I can just submit and surrender my body to the Lord. And, and during that time is when I feel closest to Allah. And these ladies were like, whoa, tell me more. And they forgot they were supposed to be teaching me about Islam. <laughs> now I was taking the, the platform. And every time we went, Madame, tell us some more. Tell us more. And I was giving them parenting classes. And they asked, who is this lamb of God? Why is he called a lamb? I said, thank you, Jesus. Let me explain that now. And I knew that God was using this whole occasion for them to hear the word of the Lord. For it does not return void. And let me tell you, they started serving all the fresh vegetables, all the beans and the brown rices, and they were educated and they moved on their education. Huh? And so many of us as Seventh-day Adventists have had this message for years. And if you've been in the church for 20-something years or more, you should, you should be on a diet of a plant-based diet. There is no excuse for us to still be indulging in the, in the flesh foods and in the meats. Even the world is leading this church, leading us now. You go to the best vegan restaurants. Are they Adventist restaurants? No. But we were given the message. And now the world is taking it to another level and we're still munching on the chicken bones. Come on, sisters, you're the providers for your home. We got to do things different. We're in the end of time. That's Christianity 101. We're in the 600s now. We got to move by the grace of God. He will empower you. Don't judge each other, but just encourage one another. Swap recipes and do things to empower your households. It's amazing. These women took to the diet. They were ready, and that's why I believe there will be people from all different races and religion who will be in heaven, who may not have heard the name Jesus, but they operated through their nature doing the right thing. Those who live up to their faith in truth, they will come into truth. They will go on to know truth. The majority of God's church is still out there. Have mercy. And that's why we ought to respect others of different faith. We have a beautiful faith, yes. We have been given a lot of knowledge, but sometimes our knowledge causes us to be puffed up and we don't know how to relate to the world. Well, I can't wait for the great revival to have some Pentecostal sisters come in here and teach the Adventist church how to praise. Because we all don't know how to praise God. We all just sit up there singing hymns dead. Funeral notes. When Jesus has done so much for us and we think holiness is silence, we think holiness is stillness. We have to have a balanced church. When you go to the games, don't you shout? Don't you talk about your favorite soap opera with excitement? Yet we don't talk about Jesus like that. God is calling us to a higher standard of Christian living where we exuberate the graciousness of Christ in everything we do. Make him the best and the first and learn how to praise God. Learn how to lift your voice and say, thank you, Jesus. I praise you, Lord. I bet if you knew Jesus was coming tomorrow, you'd be shouting. You'd be shouting. And so these precious ladies, I would just stand. I would just watch them as they peeled the potatoes and the vegetables and they got it ready. And I said, madam, ladies, what's going on? Where's the goat? <laughs> Where's the goat? And you know what they said? This is serious. They said, Madame Esme, we want to hear from Allah. We want to hear from Allah. That just touched my heart. And I said, thank you, Jesus. I loved those ladies. We built such a wonderful relationship. I could go on, but I must move on. And so I continued to pray without ceasing with my children, worshiping morning and evening. We never stopped 
And you know, Muhammad still sensed the presence of Christ in our home. He was very concerned, and he started to send the imams to come and teach me Islam. And these imams came on a regular basis, and they came and they tried to convince me, and we would share and go back and forth. And as I said, I felt like a new babe. I didn't know much scripture. And sometimes they would bring the Bible with them, a Bible they had, and show me things. And I didn't know what else to say, but I would just hear the still, small voice of Christ saying, Hold fast. I will give you the words to speak. Hold fast. More imams came. And now they became angry because they didn't see me changing. They became impatient. And they told Muhammad, you need to have this woman committed to an insane asylum. And they were serious. And Muhammad considered it. And at one time, I thought he was. And I had to pray because I had no help. And many a women are missing in Saudi Arabia who have gone from the Western countries with their husbands and families and husbands marry other wives and kill or bury them alive, put them in insanity hospitals. And I felt, God, I am so vulnerable right now. I am at his advantage right now. Anything can happen. And I said, God, please. One evening as we sat for worship, I would always keep one of my sons at the window to watch for when their father came. We worshiped in faith. And you see, this was new for my children. I was teaching them about Jesus for the first time in their lives because we were just, you know, I was just freshly baptized and now I was teaching them. They were Muslims. And so they would stay at the window and they'd say, mommy's coming and we'd put away the books that we had and, and quickly sit up and I'll peel the potatoes. They start you know, doing their little toys and things. But other than that, we would worship God. And the children felt the presence of Jesus in our circle. So often they would say, Mom, he's here. Mom, we love Jesus. I think he's more tender than Allah. And this, this is some of the things they would start telling me as I watched them convert to the place where they said, Jesus is God. It's not Allah. And we want to give our lives to Allah, to Jesus. And so, as my son stood at the window that evening, Muhammad decided to come up the back stairwell. We didn't see him, we didn't hear him, and he stepped in, he found us worshiping, he took all my books, I rushed to the bathroom, shut the door. At that point, I knew that I was dead meat. I knew he was gonna eat, beat me to death if I had stayed out there. The rage, the anger that he came in, you could feel that presence, and so, I locked myself in the bathroom door. My son then knocked on the door and said, Mommy, it's okay, come on out. He's gone, but he's taken every book you got through customs. Sisters, I was at my lowest at this point. I spent time looking for the books. I would cover, go out at night, look in the garbage, see if he threw them in there, didn't find them. And then I would say, God, why am I suffering so much? And I would just cry out to the Lord and I'd say, I'm not going to worship anymore because this is getting worse rather than better. Does it really mean all this pain to worship you, God, to have a relationship with you? I started to doubt God. And the days would go by and now Muhammad decided he would now lock me inside of the apartment and I would go, I would not be able to leave the, the home during the day. And he would take all the children with him, all five children to his workplace. And they would stay there all day and then come home with him at the end of the evening. And I was going out of my mind, just, just isolated and, and not having anyone to talk to or, or, or have anything to do. And so I was locked inside. My kids would come home. I'd feed them, of course, and, you know, make their meals during the day. And my children started to encourage me, Mom, we got to still have worship. Let's do it, Mom. Remember, Jesus said he will bring back to our memory everything we've ever learned. The comforter will come. Mommy, let's do it. And so we started to do that. And we would sit in that circle and the spirit of the Lord would come and it was beautiful. We would worship God. He would give us stories and songs. It was amazing. Well, eight days into the books being gone, one evening my children came home and they were filled with anxiety. You know when they're dying to burst, burst in to tell you something, but they got to wait. 
Muhammad left as usual to the mosque. And my son, my oldest son said, mom, 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 listen, listen. Your books? I said, my books? You've seen them? He said, yes, we've all seen them. And then the twins gathered around and said, yes, mommy, we've seen your books. They are all in Papa's office and all the men are reading them. I said, what? What? And I sat back and I thought of all the angry tones toward God and I repented. I said, I'm sorry, Lord. Truly, your thoughts are not my thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways. Your ways are higher, greater. You have a bigger plan. You took those books to a place where I, as a woman, could not go. I cannot mix with the men. But God allows trials, hard trials sometimes, in order to produce what he wants to produce. And we get mad in the trials, but God is doing another work. The influence of those books on those men, I know by the grace of God, I'm going to see some of them in the kingdom of heaven. I believe it. I know it. Because our pain is not in vain. Pain is not in vain, sisters. But now it was mandatory for the boys to be praying. They were at an age. The twins were eight. Javid was nine. And they had to be praying. And that meant the mother teaches them how to pray. And they have a Christian mother, and there's no way I'm going to teach them how to pray in Islam or teach them how to pray using the Quran. And so at this point, Muhammad's devised another plan. My books started to come back. Most of them came. They tore some of them up and discarded of them, but my Bible came back. My other hardcover books came back. I was so happy. But I realized why, because Muhammad had another plan. He had another plan. He told the boys one morning to get their coats. I was fearful and I knew something was wrong. I got that gut feeling. I started to reflect on the dream I had a couple weeks ago where I saw my sons on a narrow path and I was trying to keep them on the path and they kept falling and I kept pulling them up, pulling them up until finally they just slipped and disappeared. And that dream came back immediately. And that morning, truly, my sons were taken from me, my three sons. That evening, I was visited by Mona and Sammy, and they gave me a letter with 300 rials and said, Mohammed said he'll be gone for 10 days. Don't worry. He's taken the boys to Mecca, Medina, actually to Medina, where they will be schooled as imams. They will be priests. You are not teaching them. You therefore cannot rear them as your children anymore. And I stood. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And they gave me my two little girls. And when I went into that home, I just collapsed. I said, Lord, really? It, it, Lord, I, I, I didn't know what else to say. 300 reals for food? Well, sisters, those 10 days turned into 20 days, 40 days. No Muhammad, no sound from anyone, no communication. I was going out of my mind. And it was at... That time I really had to stretch out and reach out to Jesus. I spent time praying with my little girls, just the three of us. I started to lose weight. I started to lose my hair. I started to fret and worry. And then two months came. There was no more money left for food. We had run out of that a while back. My little girls would go off into the outside of the home and just play and in the desert. These are real life pictures of them I took. That's how small they were. And then we simply had nothing. And I said, Lord, David said, I've been young and I've been old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I said, Father, we're hungry. We need food. You sent the ravens to feed Elijah. Feed us, oh God. And I had to trust the Lord. I prayed for God's provisions. I went door to door, as it were, with my empty rice and oil canisters, and I showed the label. I couldn't read. We, there was no language that I could speak to convey my needs, but the Holy Spirit was there. And these women started to look at me. The servants in the homes looked at me with pity, and they started to fill my canister with rice, with oil, with, with seasonings, and they knew there was a woman in trouble. They knew. And these women were amazing because you know how women are. 
we read, we have intuitive, so much intuitiveness. And, and they started to send their servants over to my home with hot cooked food. Hallelujah. As I think about it, what a provision. God put it in their hearts. When we had nothing, God gave us everything. He said, just trust me. He says, in the last days, your bread and your water will be sure. We are to trust God when we have nothing. He will supply our needs. And we're heading to that crisis very soon when every resource on earth will be cut from us. And we must have learned prior to that how to trust God, how to depend on Him, how to lean on Him. So if you feel you can't miss a meal, you might be in trouble with the upcoming crisis. I'm serious, sisters. We don't make the sacrifices and train. This is a training. We are Navy SEALs. And the Navy SEALs, in order to dive into the depth, they train hard, mental and physical. And I'm not talking about works. I'm talking about God's grace empowering us to do this work. It is his grace that does that. We can't do it, but he can. And when we pray for his grace, he empowers us. And that's what makes the relationship with Jesus a supernatural one. That's how you experience the power of God. And God is calling us to that higher experience. No more mediocre Christianity. It's too late in the day. It's time for that trusting, depending, training ourselves in the power and name of Jesus. These women brought food. They brought good food. And we ate and we gained weight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sisters, I was depressed, though, at this time. And I became suicidal. You know, just as we do, we have the highs and our lows with Jesus, don't we? The highs and the lows. But how he wants us to be consistent, doesn't he? And I was very low at this time. I had missed my sons. It was two months, over two months now. And, you know, I was just trying to survive each day. And I heard the door knock. And in walked an imam. You know, the enemy comes at the lowest period of your life, doesn't he? And in walked this imam, and he came with three Bibles. And he sat down. He said, Muhammad has sent me. I said, where is Muhammad? He said, I, I will not tell you. But I want you to know that if you become a Muslim today, you will have your sons back. Say the Shahada. Say Allah is only God. And Muhammad is his prophet. And you will become a Muslim and your sons will come back. Don't you love your sons? Don't you want your children? And I started to tremble. I trembled and I contemplated with God. I, 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 I took time. And I said, God, I know how to behave like a Muslim woman. I know how to pray like them, bow down. I could pretend and then have my children back. And so I was giving God my plan. And, and I, can, I can do this, Lord, and then I can teach them secretly and nobody will ever know. Wow. Well, God had another plan. God spoke to my heart and he said, Esme, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy is not worthy. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Sometimes even God gives tough love. He is God. And he said, you're going to either trust me with this one or not. Are you my witness? Are you going to trust me? And I said, God, I will. I'll trust you. And I went back inside. I felt this surge of power. And I looked at those men. And I said, I looked at that man. And I said, keep my three sons. For I would rather live this temporary time on earth without them. And be in the kingdom of heaven with them eternally. Then have them for a short period under your rules and under the Islamic rule. 
and lose them eternally. And I made that exchange, sisters. My mouth was moving, my mind was engaged, but my body was struggling with, no, what are you doing? What are you saying? And this is where I believe the diet, the health message comes. When you have to make decisions in a crisis, the intelligence, the consciousness is there. God will speak on your behalf. He will empower you to make right decisions under the most weightiest of trial. Live for Jesus, ladies. It is a serious thing to live all the way for him. There was no turning back at this point. These men, this man was angry. He left. When he slammed that door, the whole building shook like an earthquake. I cried. I wept. I went out of control at this point, And I said, Lord, I gave up my sons. I won't see them again. My God, you're going to have to comfort me, but this pain cannot be comforted. Jesus, you can't comfort me. You can't. You just can't comfort me. And as I cried out, you know, at the very end, you, all you have is his word. And I reached out and I grabbed his word to my heart and I started flipping through the pages. I said, you need to talk to me. You need to talk to me. You need to let me know you are here. You're with me, God. And as I turned the pages, it opened up and I felt his presence come. And I looked down and it said, thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rahel, Esme, weeping for her children, and listen to this, refuses to be comforted because her children were not. Thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy, and there is hope. Blessed hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. Hallelujah. I, I dried my tears, sisters. I praised the Lord and I stood on that promise for the rest of my time. I said, Lord, if I cry, it's simply because I miss them. But in the waiting period, sisters, God is searching the heart. He's searching the heart. He's wanting to see what's really there. And I thought I was doing pretty good. But in my heart, I had become a murderer and I did not realize it. I wanted to kill Muhammad. I was so hateful toward this man right now. I hated him. I didn't want to see him. And I said, when he comes, I'm going to kill him. How could he hurt me like this? How could he take my sons like this? And then God, in those two months Muhammad was gone, started to show Esme her heart. It was no longer about Muhammad. It was about what was going on inside of me. And then I came to the place where I realized that and I had to surrender and say, God, exchange this filthy, murderous heart. Give me your heart. Give me your mind. Give me your spirit that I can live and be the, a reflection of Christ for Muhammad when he comes, Lord. I surrendered. And he said, finally, now Muhammad will come back. And so Muhammad returned. And when he returned, I embraced him. I loved him. I cared for him. I cooked for him. And the love in me was not my love. It was an agape love. It was a love that motivated me to do things I knew I could not do. God was working in me to be a reflection to Muhammad of who he is. Well, Muhammad came, we were still in Damam, and that evening, one of the evenings, I should say, he left to the mosque. And when he left, he left his briefcase. And I went in there, and I started to rummage through, and I found a card from a woman he was having an affair with in India. So the two months he was gone was because he was involved with another woman in an affair. Also, I found that my children were not in Medina, but in India. That night, they had flown them immediately to India. And they had told me they were in Mecca, Medina, but they were not. So my children are in India. Muhammad was having an affair. And I have all this information. And I say, Lord, what must I do? What must I do? My three sons, and there they are, the only picture I have of them when they were in India, are in India, Lord. How can I get them? Father, show me. 
Well, a few weeks later, Mohammed decides to take a new job and he flies off to Riyadh. He leaves the Damam and leaves me and the two girls again for another two months and moves to Riyadh. Two months later, he finally sends for us. And while we're there now in Riyadh, it's a better environment. We now meet people in hospitals working, doctors from England and other countries and America. <clears throat> And I'm able to confide in some of these ladies and they share with me a plan to escape through Cyprus and then go to India and get your children. And immediately God put the brakes on and said, Esme, no, no, you wait until your work is done. You wait until I brought you here. I will take you out. And I said, but Lord. And he said, wait, wait, I say on the Lord. Well, my children became very ill. I started hearing Muhammad on the phone with his family in England, and they were saying, you need to go get the boys. It was now six months that I had not seen my sons. Didn't know exactly where they were and what they were going through. I just knew they were in boarding schools in India, going from village to village. Two little eight-year-olds and one nine-year-old all by themselves in India. Talk about praying. Talk about the Holy Ghost waking me up in the middle of the night and say, pray. Pray. I would have dreams and see them scratching their heads, hot, flustered. And I'd pray, God, remind them of the story of the worship. The very last worship we had was about Joseph being taken away to the land of Egypt. I said, God, remind them. Remind them how to eat. Remind them to be polite. Remind them to be Christians. The waiting seemed endless. Eventually, Muhammad left. Things were winding up, and he had to go to get them. And that day, when that door opened, and I saw my three little Hebrew boys come, I embraced them. I loved on them. It was an amazing experience. We played games. We hung out at the parks together, and we made it for lost time. God brought them back, and my son says, Mom, we're still Christians. They said, even in the mosque, we were praying, Allahu Akbar, oh Jesus, come and save us. Allahu Akbar, oh Jesus, come and take us back to our mom. They said, our faith is strong, mom. Jesus gave us dreams and showed us that we would be rescued. And two weeks later, Papa came and took us home. God is still with us, mom. And so now Muhammad decides he would get another wife. He had to get another wife because the fact that I was not teaching them Islam. He needed another wife. And so he said, she must be the teacher. I started to cry out to the Lord at this point, crying out, asking God, Lord, I cannot share my body with another woman. Do something, Father. Well, I prayed for an army to come. And I said, God, send an army. Do what you have to do. Blow up the oil tanks. Do whatever you need. Saddam Hussein at that time entered Kuwait. And I said, thank you for the army, Lord. Saddam Hussein is my hero. I said, Father, thank you. Listen, Muhammad came home one evening and said, we have to send all the families home. Only the men can stay by, but all the families have to go home. Sisters, our time had come. Our ministry had come to an end. Our family at that time was called by a friend of mine, Claire, and they had bought air tickets, six air tickets in faith, knowing there was imminent war about to occur in the Middle East. And they made calls, and the churches in England and the churches in America was praying for this little family stuck in Saudi Arabia. And they sent six air tickets in faith with a date on it. And when Muhammad came and, and started to share, when I begged him for us to go, he said, no, but then God did something again. He came and he said, we have to send all the families home. The finances for our job and our employment has crashed. There is no monies and they can only take care of the workers. So all the families were now packing. The wives and their children were packing. We could no longer have the beautiful home we had. They were putting them in single men's quarters. So the, with the air tickets there and everything, we finally were able to fly out with dignity, not running through the deserts, looking across and seeing my precious five children, and we finally landed in London Heathrow Airport. 
And there I called Muhammad. I said, Muhammad, we've arrived safely. He says, you left too soon. He says, my job is reestablished. The finances are there. All the families that were packed have unpacked and they're here. But you were one of the first to leave. He says, I need you to come back. And I said, Lord, Lord, my work, is it, is it not done? And I prayed and I went to the word of God as I normally do. And as I opened the word, the word said, Galatians 5, 1, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I said, thank you, Jesus. Truly, Lord, freedom has come for me. Freedom has come for me. Well, Muhammad went on to marry his wife. We were divorced. And now I was a single mom with five children. There was an opportunity for me to leave England and go to America, back to the United States. The divorce went through. The courts gave me full custody of all five children. And I had nothing. He was a wealthy man, and I had nothing. And I, had, I got custody. So we left for the United States. I was able to get into the, uh, to Andrews University. They had a single parent program there. And I joined the program and finally started to pray, God, you said in your word, those who have left mother, father, brother, husband, wife, sister, for your sake, you will recompense them. So I said, Lord, bless me with a husband. Bless me with a good man. Who can be a priest in my home and help me rear these children while I'm here at school studying? I was so afraid. I was only 32 and I had teenage sons and I needed God to step in and help me. I joined a prayer group and we were all praying for a husband for Esme and her five kids. <laughs> and the folks were looking on like, we'll, we'll pray. Okay. Five kids. Oh, we'll pray, Esme. In fact, we'll fast and pray. And listen, we must believe when we pray, sisters. I prayed for a man who loved God more than me. I asked God to create this man because he didn't exist, really. You know, he's going to be a father of five children. And then God spoke and said, he's going to marry a minister. And I said, Lord, no, I'm a divorcee. I have five children. And God said, that's going to be his first church. <laughs> a minister. But God, and I argued back and forth with God. And God said, no, that's what I have prepared. That's who I have prepared for you. I said, God, I just want a little old man. <laughs> just a little old guy who's going to heaven, who's serious, who loves you more than me. But God, even though we've failed him, he still gives us the best. What a God. What we don't deserve. And so this play comes about. And in this play, a lady calls me up. She said, Esme, I heard you did a little bit of drama. I said, yeah, I did a little bit. And she said, this play is Adam and Eve. Would you play the part of Eve? I said, sure, who's Adam? <laughs> and I said, is he a minister? And she said, oh, honey, I don't know. Uh, I think he's in computer science. I said, hmm, I asked God to create. You know, I'm thinking that the way I believe God and I have a relationship. I said, but God, you know, create, minister. Um, um, okay, all right. So I said, yes, I'll be in the play. And so the play was coming about. I started to set a date. That's right. I started to set a date with God because it was October and I'm waiting on the Lord because I told the Lord I want to be married next June. <laughs> I sure did. I gave God a date. You know what? When you've been through some trials with God, you can ask of him anything. Ha! Huh. I said, Lord, we stood our ground. I'm a single mom right now because of you. So listen. <laughs> I said, listen, we, we, we got to go through this together. I want to be married next June, God. Would you do that? He says, oh, we'll see. We'll work on it. We'll work on it. Well, that was my prayer. Next June. All right. And so God tells me I'm marrying a minister. So guess where I go for my worship and devotion at Andrews University? I go to the seminary. And I sit in the back. And I'm scouting out all these pastors. <laughs> And I'm saying, God, which one is it? <laughs> oh, he looks fine. Then I see his wife come in. I say, oh, not him. I say, Lord, which one is it? And I'm waiting. You know, if he says it was an engineer, then I would have to go to the engineer school. You got to obey his voice. And so I'm in seminary watching to see who this pastor is. And then I remember praying one morning 
It was my devotion time. And I said, Lord, I got a class to get to and I'm going to be late and finish it up. I got, I'm going to be late, Lord. And I said, Father, I need to hear your voice. Come on, God, speak. When am I going to meet this man? June is around the corner. God, come on. It's, it's coming up. It's the end of October now. And I'm praying and I sit in silence and I wait. And then I hear God's voice say, you will meet him tonight. And I get up, I put my backpack on, I rush off to school, and I'm excited because God spoke. And I know that voice. And that evening was the evening of the rehearsal, the first rehearsal of the play. And I'm thinking, it must be Adam, but he's in computer science. How is God going to work all of this? How is it going to work all of this? And so that night at the rehearsals, this wonderful guy walks down. He's handsome, he's fine. And I said, Lord, and I said, Lord, I'll obey your voice. <laughs> I'll obey your voice. I've been there and done that. I won't choose, but I said, Father, choose for me. Is it this man? You said, I'm going to meet him tonight. So he comes up, and I emerge from his side, and I look into his eyes, and there's love. There's all this nice chemistry going on, and I'm fighting the feelings, and I'm saying, God, but he's in computer science. <laughs> well, at the end of the play, we step down, and we finally introduce ourselves to each other, this wonderful Adam here. And he says, what's your major? And I tell him I'm doing social studies, social work, in fact, was my major at the time. And I said, so what is your major? I, you know, I knew it was computer science. He says, well, I'm just finishing up my last quarter in, my, in theology. I said, what? And he said, I've just been accepted into the seminary. I said, what? You're going to be a pastor? He said, yeah. He looked at me like, what a weird woman. I said, like... A pastor who preaches and teaches? He said, yes. And I look up immediately. I said, thank you, Jesus, for my husband. Thank you, Lord. And I say, Lord, when are you going to tell him? And so that night we part. I go on my way. The play is a wonderful experience. And the next morning, I, I can feel he kind of likes me, you know. And then the, the, when the play is done, the two weeks of the play, and he says, um, he doesn't know what to say, but he, then he says, you know, can, you, can, you meet, can we meet for breakfast in the morning? I'd love to cook you a meal. I said, oh, fabulous, yes. And so we meet, and that's it. We had breakfast that morning. Oh, his story is another story. And let me tell you, God took him step by step for him to receive and accept his wonderful family. And <laughs> he thought I only had two kids at first because I always had the two little girls. But then somebody told him, man, anybody who marries Esme, they got a full plate. He says, what do you mean? She only has two kids. He says, no, she has five. <laughs> what? What a man of God, loving God more than me. He had to hear God's voice. Don't you agree? Amen. And so heaven rejoiced at this decision. I'm going to get ready to sing my song to give God praise as we close out this section. And I rejoiced on earth. My prayer team rejoiced on earth. And as I flip through these slides, as I sing my song of gratitude to the Lord, how great thou art, I pray that you will see God in all.